Okay, let's get started. I hope uh, you can all hear me and folks are still signing on. Uh, welcome to uh, a webinar, uh, an introduction and a deep dive into the JD Next initiative. My name is Dan Rodriguez and uh, I'm a professor of law at Northwestern University Pritzker School of Law. I've had the good fortune to serve in a variety of uh, leadership capacities in legal education and maybe more relevant to our discussion, I've also had the good privilege of serving as a dean twice beginning in 1998 at the University of San Diego and, and extending to 2018 with a break in between at Northwestern Law School. So I've had through that leadership experience a uh, couple decades of having the opportunity like those of you on this, on this webinar, both participants and panelists, to, to look very closely at the evolving uh, nature and scope of law school uh, admissions. And I want to start out with a with a quotation from the Bible, actually, if you'll permit me. I think this is consistent with the separation of church and state. And that is from Ecclesiastes, which ends uh, 1 uh, 9 uh, with there's nothing new under the sun. And so uh, JD next is, as we'll talk about over the course of the next hour, I think gives the gives the lie to that to that uh, depiction or that acknowledgement, certainly in the area of admissions. It is uh, very much a game changer, something uh, new and consistent with what's been the agenda and objective of all of us in legal education, and those of us who've led law schools, been part of the admissions process in law schools, which is seeking to accomplish simultaneously two imperatives, two goals. Certainly law schools have their own mission and their own priorities, but we can share in common among all of us, wherever we are, the goal first of making sure that we're admitting students who have a likelihood of succeeding in our academic programs and will succeed not only in law school, but in the bar and within the profession. And second, uh, maybe tied for first in, in, in many respects, making sure that we are admitting and enrolling a robustly diverse class based on a variety of criteria, certainly including but not limited to gender, race and ethnicity, uh, previous experience uh, and the like. Uh, the, the admissions process over the course of the ma many years and decades has been imperfect, to put it mildly, but we've by and large been able to succeed with diligence and with strategy in accomplishing those goals in no small part due to two factors that are that are not, uh, don't fall from manna from the sky to stick with the biblical theme, but are very much part of uh, intentional projects and programs uh, among stakeholders in law schools. First, we have had for a very long time, uh, one and now two, uh, uh, to use the magic words, valid and reliable admissions tests. Certainly the LSAT uh, and the GRE have uh, been validated through, through many, many years of experience. And while imperfect, they tell us some useful information about law students' uh, likelihood of success in law school. They are, of course, part of a holistic admissions process in which we have the opportunity to look at other criteria. And uh, we have had uh, historically the, uh, the good fortune, we might even call it a luxury, which I'm sure none of us take for granted, of being able consistent with the law and consistent of our academic policies at our respective law schools and universities, the ability to look at so-called non-quantitative criteria, to be able to, uh, to enhance the diversity of our class in a variety of ways. For reasons you well know, and I'm sure we'll talk about on this call, and I won't go into in any in any depth and detail, uh, these uh, uh, these assumptions, these uh, fundamentals, uh, are precarious, and, and in some respects have been have come under some amount of scrutiny at the very least, and maybe jeopardy at most. Uh, first, uh, we know that uh, there has been a persistent problem with the pool uh, of of uh, potential law students, uh, the diversity needle, as it were has moved somewhat, but not nearly as much as we would like. And so all law schools stress and strain and struggle to make sure that we have an adequately robust and, uh, pool to enable us to pursue our goals, our valid goals and our important goals of diversity in our entering, entering classes. And there's certainly no, uh, by no means any magic bullet for how we ought to go about that. Second, the, again, without belaboring the point, there's been uh, concerns with the over-reliance on standardized tests in particular, the concerns that they uh, have uh, differential uh, outcomes uh, on the basis of race, race and ethnicity, and we can we can talk a great deal about why that is so. But we know it is so, and that and that differentiation uh, differential has been has been troublingly persistent. 
Third, and coming at it from the other direction, there's been a concern that many of us uh, feel, not universally to be sure, but that many of us feel that we're moving to an era in which we might under rely on tests. And there is a testing optional, anti-testing movement, whatever you want to label it, uh, a concern that, uh, that uh, schools are moving away from criteria that have historically enabled us to make predictive judgments based on solid social science. And that dynamic has, has raised some, some concerns about the, the part of the holistic admissions process that we are, uh, that we are there. And fourth, and we will certainly raise this uh, 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 on the call and have adequate time for discussion, uh, certainly the elephant that's squarely in the room is the Supreme Court's decision in the last uh, few weeks uh, that, that casts a pall over the use by law schools of uh, certain admissions uh, processes, call them so-called racial uh, and ethnic preferences, that has put the, uh, some aspect of the admissions process in jeopardy. So to finally get to the point, uh, what, what, what I have learned and, and a number of us have, have learned over the time in which we've looked at pre-law preparation programs and other ways of augmenting the admissions process and augmenting the use of standardized tests is that there are a variety of ways to skin the cap. And the JD Next initiative that we'll hear about today that I have the privilege to have been able to participate uh, to some degree over the course of several years working with the folks at the University of Arizona and elsewhere is, uh, as I said at the outset, a potential game changer. There have been pre-law programs in the past and there, there are a plethora of programs that are designed to increase the pipeline to help students uh, uh, achieve better as they begin the first year, a number of initiatives uh, represented by some organizations that are in this webinar have worked hard on, uh, on developing such uh, programs. But until now, there has not been any uh, uh, significant effort to establish the scientific reliability as it were, of these uh, pre-law programs and the assessments, the tests that come at the end of them, end of them for law school performance until JD uh, next. And we'll hear some of the details of this later. But let me just tee up the discussion by saying, I hope that all of you on this webinar, and as you go uh, back to your respective schools, will look very closely and carefully at this really interesting, remarkably sophisticated, and I think uh, evolving, assessment tool, uh, and also a pre-law program to really see how it might help uh, augment and aid your processes of holistic admissions in the law school cycle. So with that, we have a, a, a combo of folks who, who've been involved in this uh, in this uh, journey in many respects. And I will lead it off by, uh, by uh, turning things over for the next few minutes to our able leaders from the ABA section on legal education and admissions to the bar, who I'm sure are known to all of you, Bill Adams, the Managing Director, and Stephanie Jiggets, the Deputy Managing Director of the ABA, uh, and I'll leave it to them to take, to take it away. And, and as you saw from the previous slide, we have a program that we'll march along with and, and provide an adequate opportunity for questions at the end. So I'll, I'll take it away, Bill. Thank you, Dan. As Dan has alluded to, under our standards, as I'm sure everyone on this call is aware of, um, all every applicant, every applicant to uh, law school generally has to have either a, a, has to have a valid and reliable admissions test, which the council has uh, agreed the LSAT and GRE uh, satisfy that. Um, they received a variance application from the University of Arizona with its uh, JD Next program, and we're impressed with the data. So, um, and results thus far, and we granted, and the council granted a variance to them. Uh, because our variance rules require law, uh, law school as opposed to a program to get a variance, um, after discussion with the council, it was decided, therefore, we other schools that participate need to uh, get a variance as well. Um, we are going to try to make it as simple as possible. And uh, Stephanie will talk uh, about the form that we're gonna ask everyone to fill out. Um, but um, I think you can feel relatively conf confident that uh, filling out the form will be sufficient for us to uh, give you a variance to participate in the program. There will be requirements for you to uh, give us reports on the progress of the students because council is interested 
in expanding the ability of applicants to get into law school without um, the LSAT and GRE. And it wants to look at the data. And so the reports will ask you to report on the progress of uh, the students that you admit through this program. So that I'm going to turn it over now to Stephanie to talk briefly about the form that will ask participating schools to fill out. Thanks, Bill. So we did create a pretty short form. It's an online form, and we sent an email out about two or three weeks ago on the deans and the associate deans listserv. Um, the form is also available on our website now, and I'm also going to um, to post a link in the chat so everyone has it. But the form basically just asks some basic questions since the council has already approved this variance, but they want each school to submit an application. So it asks if you are going to use JD Next in the 2024 admission cycle. It asks about how many students you plan to admit with JD Next. And then there is a confirmation um, that each school has to make that they understand um, that this variance is being granted in accordance with standard 107. Um, and so once that form is completed and submitted to us, the deadline is July 31st. Um, the council will review these short applications at its next meeting in August. And then the um, next date for the next deadline for submitting an application will be October 13th of 2023 for the council to review at the November meeting. Now, one of the a couple of questions we we have received thus far um, since we posted the sent out the uh, form um, was whether a school needed to apply for this variance if they were going to continue to use it as a predictor of success. So, in other words. They, a law student would still take an LSAT or a GRE, but would take the JD next after being admitted to the law school. Um, and if that's the case, you do not need to complete the uh, variance request form. Um, again, on the form, you will see that the schools that are granted the variances will have an annual reporting requirement. We haven't, you know, we'll look at admissions information and bar pass information when that becomes available. And we'll provide um, additional details on, on what that looks like once the council has reviewed its applications and granted the variances. And with that, um, I will turn it over to the next person. So I will, I will just, uh, by way of a segue, take this opportunity to introduce uh, someone who's I'm sure known to many, if not most of you on the webinar, and that's Dean Mark Miller of the University of Arizona. JD Next, of course, was developed. Uh, uh, out of the University of Arizona and under under uh, Mark's uh, leadership. So turn the floor over to you, Mark. And thank you. And thank you to everyone who's uh, participating today and then many others who've reached out. Uh, we have been and are glad to meet with any school, with a team, with individuals. We know there are lots of questions. So we really appreciate the participation today, but it's a wide open invitation to talk about uh, JD Next. I'm only gonna take a minute or two before we get into more of the science behind it and the details, but just wanna acknowledge a very brief history. Uh, the U of A, as Dan mentioned, was the first law school to add the GRE as a basis for JD admissions, uh, ultimately, something approved by the council uh, for use by law schools more generally. When we did that uh, more than six years ago, we were asked by a number of deans and faculty and folks in outside institutions why we had moved forward with an additional uh, familiar uh, standardized exam rather than develop a new law school specific admissions exam. Uh, the answer had to do with the familiarity of the GRE and ETS is willing to point us to work with us and the use of the GRE and other graduate programs and the ability to do the science in a fairly straightforward fashion. What we knew at the time is that it would take a good bit of resources and years to develop a separate exam, but that's what we've done 
with JD Next with the help of many, many law schools, almost 40 law schools have participated in the development process and this, their students and helped us to get the data so that we could uh, both assess and publish on it. And then as Dan noted, of course, what we didn't know would be coming, uh, the US Supreme Court in the SFFA decision has certainly made the timeliness of what we have done, which is create a test that reduces score disparities based on race, um, all the more important. Uh, we're focusing today on JD Next as a basis for JD admissions, but you will also hear about the parallel research on the course, not the exam, uh, as a predictor of and indeed an enabler of uh, student uh, uh, success. And so I'd like to turn things over to Chris Robertson. When we began this effort, he was a colleague and associate dean here at the University of Arizona. He's now on the faculty of Boston University. He's the founding principal investigator, and he will share uh, more work, more details on the work that has been done thus far. Chris? Thank you so much, Mark. Um, let me make sure I've got my video on. I think I do. Um, so I want to start by acknowledging um, a real a huge research team, actually two different research teams that have been working over five years to produce these four peer-reviewed papers uh, in which we have worked to pre-register our studies on the open science framework, conduct the research showing that the course is, a, is, is effective at impacting law school grades, uh, outcomes or that the uh, exam is effective at predicting those law school outcomes. We publish those papers in peer-reviewed journals, which I'm happy to share all these. They're also on our website. Um, and then we've replicated this work in, in subsequent cohorts of students with additional researchers from, from other institutions. So this really has been an effort in open science and really a team effort in, uh, 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 from a wide range of people uh, including several on this call, uh, like Jess Finley, who uh, will uh, join us uh, towards the end during the Q&A. So as you can see, this is the, the flagship journal of legal education, the flagship journal of empirical legal studies, an ETS technical report, and um, uh, a leading uh, educational journal we've continued working through. So everything I'll show you will be from those studies. Now, um, I'd like to maybe level set uh, with something we're all familiar with, which is the LSAT. The, um, you know, we've been using the LSAT in legal education for decades, uh, really on the assumption that it uh, predicts uh, first year grades. That's been the main basis for validating the LSAT, although we were interested in bar passage and career success and other things. The validation studies have primarily focused on first year grades and that's what we set out to do here too. What I'm showing you here is the most recent uh, uh, validity study um, from uh, LSAC, which you can see on their website, which looks at uh, the recent years culminating in 2019. And just to give us sort of a, a working basis to start with, I want to point out this, this correlation here of 0 0.40. We see that as sort of the gold standard, which is the LSAT, um, uh, that, that says that, um, you know, the correlation between first year grades and LSAT scores is about 0 0.40 which is a significant correlation, but it's still alone explaining much less than half of the variance in law school grades, as you all know. Some students surprise us in either direction. But take note of that 0 0.40 because I'll be showing you data from the JD Next that I want you to compare to that, uh, that um, sort of benchmark. Now, the second thing though we're concerned with is not just the predictive power of the test to predict first year grades, the second level set we need to do is, is, is how fair the test is. Does the test produce or reproduce large racial disparities? Um, and if so, can we do better? And that's uh, another sort of benchmarking. So this is another one of LSAC's, uh, LSAC's uh, technical reports on their LSAT test um, that you can uh, download from the website. This one, uh, the most recent year is 2014. I just wanna show you a little bit of this historical data this graph may not be the easiest uh, to read. Let me point out uh, two of the, the main points on the graph. Um, uh, here you can see this um, dot, this solid blue line is representing African-Americans as the label was used in 2014. And you can see uh, this dotted green line is Caucasians again. Um, and you can see 
the average LSAT score between these two groups is about 10 points uh, apart. This raw score disparity, um, as you know, and as, as Aaron Taylor has written really compellingly, this is used to sort students in our system of legal education, not just where they're admitted, but also how much they pay, right? We know that students at the top above the LSAT median uh, are more likely to get merit-based scholarships. Those below are more likely to full, pay full ride. And so this 10 point score disparity really creates a challenge for recruiting um, a representative class while maintaining your LSAT medians. Well, this data ends in 2014, but, but just this year, LSAC has re released uh, more recent data. And uh, I'm sorry to report, it tells essentially the same story. The legend is on top instead of the bottom, but the colors uh, are the same. And you see again, this gap, it actually seems to have grown a little bit notwithstanding what I'm sure have been good faith efforts over a decade or more to try to reduce these known racial disparities, they have been persistent. And, um, and so this is really what, again, a benchmark for you to think about, and I'll show you data on the JD Next soon. This is really one of the motivations for us approaching um, um, JD Next as an alternative admissions test. So now, this really primes us to think about what is it that we want to measure? A lot of the standardized testing movement, um, a lot of the reaction to the standardized testing movie, the, the detesting or the non-testing has been to suggest that this is a poor way to measure merit. And you may know Professor Veneer's really compelling arguments in this regard, but she suggested instead of thinking of merit as something a child is born with, like innate intelligence or something, we need to think about it as something that she or we can help cultivate. And this quote really means a lot to me because I think this is what, why we're all in this business of law schools, why we've all committed to these careers is because we want to help students grow through law school. We're not just picking winners, we're developing skills in legal analysis and legal professionalism. And so this really motivates the JD Next to develop um, a testing experience that reflects our, our, the growth of a student or the growth potential of a student. Now, this really drives our unique structure of pairing a course with a test. If we want to know a student's learning potential, we have to give them a formative environment to learn and then measure how well they've actually done so. So the unique contribution here is a test that is really linked to a course um, so that we're actually measuring the learning over time. And this is a, a theory of testing that actually goes back to the 1920s and before. It's, it's sort of a road not taken by mainstream standardized testing since then, but it's one we're bringing back essentially. Uh, and you see this sort of work, whether it's called proximal or dynamic, or sometimes it's called curriculum sampling testing. It's more commonly used in Europe. JD Next is an instance of this pairing a test to a course. And it actually um, seems to be working. So over these five years of work, we have been studying the test thanks to, as Mark mentioned, uh, $1.25 million in support, um, both uh, in total, both through uh, ETS, the organization that owns the GRE was supporting the program for a time and consistently through Access Lex Institute. We've shown that this test is valid and reliable. It has in internal consistency, inter rater reliability, and, and we actually administered the test in the first year in a randomized experiment to both students who'd taken the course and the students that hadn't. And we've shown highly significant differences in their test scores, as you might hope, which, but that suggests that the test really is measuring what happens in the course, which is a form of content validity. And notice here, this course isn't about logic games. This course isn't about, um, um, you know, abstract reasoning, it's really about the ability to read cases and do legal analysis. And we'll show you a little bit more on that in a moment. But really the data speaks for itself. This is just a raw scatter plot showing fall 1L GPA on the vertical axis and JD Next scores. And this year we did it on a 55 point scale. What you can see here is this clear correlation between them. And here's that R value that I asked you to write down the R equals 0.4 that you saw in the most recent LSAC report. Our first time out of the gate, we're hitting R equals 0.48, predicting what we say is about as well, maybe better uh, than the LSAC. So we did it again in 2020. Here you can see a larger sample size, 
Now we're working with um, 17 law schools around the country. And you can see almost the identical correlation again in that same ballpark with the LSAT. We do it again in 2020. Uh, and uh, this data is analyzed uh, in the ETS technical report that's forthcoming. And here again, you see uh, this nice strong uh, correlation. Of course, we'd love to predict more of law school grades, but we're doing, uh, we've, we've developed sort of um, a, a test that's meeting sort of the, uh, the professional gold standards and benchmarks. So um, now you'll recall the other question I asked you to think about is these racial disparities in scores. One challenge for thinking about this is the LSAT and the JD Next are of course measured on different score scales. So saying they have an 11 point difference doesn't really tell you anything if they're on different scales. So the way social scientists solve this problem is they use standard deviation units, uh, which in this case is called a G score. And so here we've actually pooled all of the racial and ethnic groups, not just black students, but also we've included um, um, Native American and Hispanic students uh, that are all seem to suffer a score disparity on the LSAT at different levels. And so that all together comes down to about three quarters of a standard deviation, 0.79 on the LSAT. You can see that's a little 95% confidence interval you see there, the, the, the line and the fact that it doesn't cross zero indicates that is a statistically significant, in fact, highly significant finding. In contrast, you see over here for the, L, for the JD Next, We've cut that into about one fourth as large of a disparity. And in fact, uh, because the dot, the line, the constant interval crosses zero, we actually can't rule out a null hypothesis, meaning that there's no significant score disparity by race on the JD Next. And we've also replicated this in a subsequent study with more data. So that is, I think, the, the really landmark finding. I just wanna emphasize why we think this works is it's a whole different approach to testing that's linked to the course, as I explained. So let me show you a little bit more about that course. First of all, we've developed this fully online course using state-of-the-art um, instructional design uh, advice. And we built it off of uh, an undergraduate set of materials produced by Rob Williams, one of the leading um, uh, scholars in indigenous people's law and policy. And we've actually scattered throughout the course images and video and voices of, um, uh, of perspectives that aren't just you know, white males. But in the substance of the course, we're really stepping through the sorts of skills a student would need to learn on day one. We first give an explanation, then we show them how we do it. Then we give them a, a little comprehensive quiz to see if they got it. Then we give them guided practice doing it themselves. Then we say, now do it without the guides, do it on your own. Now evaluate yourself in a model walkthrough and then you submit it again. This step-by-step -step training wheels process is actually exactly how um, uh, learning science suggests is optimal. There's no 90 minute long videos. There's no, uh, everything's broken down into bites and pieces. After teaching these basic skills that students are using, looking at some classic cases, we then say, okay, now see if you can use these skills to actually extract doctrine from the cases yourself. So this is the sort of things you'll be doing in law school. On day one, you see these classic cases like Hammer versus Sidway and Hawkins versus McGee. Here we have them, okay, you read the case, see if you can find the holding and the relevant facts. You get automatic immediate feedback. Um, then we give you a lecture, a problem of the day, and again, a guided self-evaluation. So this highly structured uh, process has been shown um, to be effective. So this is what we hear from students. You know, they, uh, of course, we've done a lot of evaluations uh, at the end of the courses, but they're telling us uh, he, uh, that they feel much more prepared. It's giving them a sense of how to think like a lawyer. And sometimes in addition to the, the, the surveys we conduct, they actually just reach out to us. This is a student that found me um, and wanted to email me and tell me, uh, thank her for JD Next and how she was experiencing the first year of, of law school as a breeze feeling like it's been so beneficial to lay a foundation. So we've also though, most bridge programs really stop there. You have anecdotes, you have qualitative results, but we actually ran a randomized experiment in the first year where we actually assigned students to a control group, which had a placebo course versus JD Next. And then we actually got their grades a year later and we, uh, we, and we surveyed them a year later. And we found these persistent benefits reporting 
uh, greater legal skills and knowledge, greater ability to solve legal problems, doing exactly the sorts of things we taught them to do. And this is really the remarkable finding is that we actually saw in this randomized experiment, a 0.20 higher GPA of students that completed the JD Next program. We also then replicated this in a subsequent study that showed a dose response. The more of the program they completed, the higher the grade benefit they got. And this has been both in a randomized national experience, experiment enriched to get a, a, a very diverse population where most of the respondents, most of the students in the sample were not um, white. Uh, most of them were Hispanic or black or other groups. And we found that uh, this, this benefit persisted across all these different groups. Uh, and so it was a really powerful, exciting finding to be able to do this national randomized experiment. And of course, we're controlling for all the relevant covariates. So wrapping up here, I just want to emphasize that for an admissions officer, what's distinctive here is you actually get two things out of JD Next. First, you get this credential, which tells you the student is likely to outperform what you otherwise would have thought based on their undergrad GPA or based on their LSAT because they've gone through this program. And second, you actually get a test score to show where on the scale uh, they're performing, and we've shown that predict. So it's, it's sort of a, a double whammy in what, in what you get out of the JD Next. Okay, so um, I hope we've persuaded you that this is at least an interesting option. And so now you have a million questions about what the program could actually look like this coming fall. And the, the headline finding point I wanna really emphasize, especially for those who have participated in JD Next for the last five years as schools, you've provided us data, you've helped us administer the course in the summer. This is all different. We're now pivoting to an admissions function. And so now we're looking at administering the program centrally through JD Next, administering a, a test with proctoring and getting your admissions office the scores in time so that you can use them this coming January. So that's the, the bottom line I just want to emphasize, and I'll show you some details, is that this is not the same thing you've been doing for the last four years. It's the same course and the same exam, but in a completely different uh, mode of administration so that you can rely on it for admissions. So to emphasize that point, uh, here in 2024 and 2025, we'll have two cohorts. The new one is this fall cohort, and it's going to be designed to produce an admissions score. Prospective students will enroll directly with JD Next at jdnext.org, uh, and the course will be administered by JD Next and um, a vendor that we're contracting with to help us do that. Uh, and the course will run in October and November so that we can then produce scores for you in January. Now we will also, for schools that wanna have a bridge program this summer, as we've done in the past, you know, there's lots of other alternatives to the JD Next to do summer bridge programs. In fact, our, our partner, Access Lex, has a very compelling one. But if you'd like to use JD Next for that, um, uh, we have uh, we will offer it again. And you may choose to assign students uh, from your wait list to the JD Next program so that you can sort of consider their completion as an additional plus factor, even if they already have a, an LSAT or a GRE score. In this setting, you'll be the one that invites students to your JD Next program if you choose to do so. You can administer the course with coaches like you've done this summer, and we'll run the course in June and July. And we can give you school reports by the end of July if you wanna make some last uh, minute um, uh, acceptances, perhaps off your wait list or a condition, conditional admission program. So you could use the variance either way, but you could also use that for students that have um, the um, uh, other test scores as well. But I really wanna emphasize the fall cohort is the thing to focus on right now. It's gonna be your mainstream path to using JD Next to admission, for admissions. So you'll also be asking about money, of course. Uh, for schools, the bottom line point is there is no cost for schools to use uh, JD Next scores, just like you receive LSAT scores and GRE scores. There's no cost to schools. The costs are borne uh, by the test takers as with um, these other standardized tests. We have not yet announced the exact prices that we'll be charging this, this fall, but from the beginning with the support of our funders uh, and the very reason we're doing this is really to generate access to open the doors to legal education. And in thinking about the cost, the real key is to understand that this includes the preparing for, we're actually including the course as part of JD Next, sitting for the exam and sending scores in the LSAT, all those are costly. 
we're going to put all that together in 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 a in a, in a package of, of prices that, that that we really uh, are aiming to make less expensive. As you can imagine, there are some costs involved in administering this at scale, and um, uh, and we have to pass some of those on, including say proctoring and uh, identification of of you know to make sure people who say they're taking the test are really taking the test. Things like that aren't free, and so we have costs that we'll need to pass on. Uh, last on this logistics point, of course, we will have accommodations for people with disabilities. Um, uh, we'll be reporting scores directly to schools. You won't have to rely on, you know, the, the, the test taker saying, I promise I got a, you know, 72. Uh, we'll be sending you the scores securely and directly to your admissions offices. And uh, we'll also be providing a score interpretation tool so you know how to make sense of the JD Next score. Like, what does this even mean? Uh, we'll put that in context for you. So just to reemphasize the fall timeline, uh, the main deadline you're facing right now, uh, as, um, uh, as our colleagues from the ABA explained, is July 31st so for you to submit that variance intention form. Um, then in August, uh, uh, either, either immediately or in August, you might be able to amend your LSAC application and school websites to say, hey, we're accepting JD Next scores. Uh, in September, we'll announce all those details, the exact dates and costs and the testing partner, in October, prospective students will begin enrolling in the course. And then as I said, in December and January, the test will be administered and scores reported out. We know that schools rely on that mid-January LSAC administration uh, to, um, to make uh, your decisions. Uh, we're gonna be on that same timeline. We're not asking you to change the very structure of admissions. Okay, we'll definitely stand for your questions. We have plenty of time, but um, that hopefully gives you the framework of the science and uh, the coming admissions cycle. And Dan, would you like to introduce some of the, the friends of JD Next? I'm happy to, although um, I'm anxious to hear from them directly. So let me immediately get to it. Access Lex has been mentioned a couple of times. They've been a very, very important partner from the very beginning. I, I believe Chris Chapman is here. So Chris, why don't you get us started? Great. Hey, thank you, Dan. And, and, and thank you for everybody for coming on here. I'm, I'm joined here with... Um, but with me today from Access Lex is Aaron Taylor. He's a senior vice president and our executive director of the Center for Legal Education Excellence, which um, administers lots of things, including our, our, our grant programs. And so in the interest of time, I'm gonna do the talking here, but uh, you know, if it's questions and answers about um, any of the research we've done in this area, you know, Aaron's here and, and available as well. So. So for those of you who don't know, Access Lex Institute has worked for over 40 years to facilitate and increase access to legal education for all, but with special emphasis on demographic groups that are underrepresented in law school classes. You know, more specifically, our strategic objective in this area reads, we aim to materially increase the pool of admission eligible law school applicants from underrepresented racial and socioeconomic populations. And you know, the key part of that is to increase the pool. Um, you know, one of the charts you saw is that, um, you know, there's a lot of flatness in curves uh, on uh, certainly on, on racial and ethnic grounds and, and, you know, our approach has been to try to increase that pool um, so that there are more admission eligible um, persons from disadvantaged and minority backgrounds. And one of the strategies we do to employ, one of the strategies we employ to pursue this objective is to support the efforts of third parties like the James E. Rogers College of Law, to create tools that identify such applicants outside the traditional standardized test score and undergraduate GPA box. And we pursue this, we pursue this despite the likely benefit that a standardized test provided as a strong buttress against the hidden and often not so hidden bias in law school admissions in the 1900s. And also, despite the fact that we recognize that a high test score does provide a benefit to a certain cohort of applicants today. Um, much research, including our own, and I think Chris Robertson referenced it, shows that many unrepresented pers underrepresented persons with potential and desire fall through the cracks, creating a loss for the applicant, their family, their descendants, law schools and society at large. In JD Next, you know, we see that potential which is why we provided the initial grant funding to allow Arizona to stand up the program and work to demonstrate whether it could achieve its objective or not. And it's why we provided additional funding support for the program this year. And you know, we believe that if JD Next is successful, we can give admissions offices a tool to better identify that untapped potential that's out there at the margins. And that results in a win for everybody. So again, 
you know, we're very supportive of the program. Um, you know, it's we've seen it, you know, from an idea probably six years ago to this, and 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 um, you know, we're happy to um, have hopefully hopefully um, produced another supported the production of a tool to help um, help all of us achieve our goals. So thank I think you. We have Joe Terry from Aspen here. If he can hear me, can you jump in? Thanks. Welcome, Joe. Sure, Cam. Thank you. Uh, so let me begin by just saying that Mark has been a trusted advisor to me and to Aspen for many years now. And even before that, uh, Mark was really the perfect Aspen author. He and I started talking about this back in January. Um, and I think JD Next is just extremely exciting. Um, the more we've learned about it, the more eager we are to find ways to support it and to work together. And um, we hope that, you know, in the coming weeks, we'll have something more tangible to say about that. But um, suffice it to say, I think it's a really great a, a great thing that's underway, and I, I'd love to have Aspen be part of it. Great, thanks, Janelle Sanchez. Uh, yeah, thank you. That right, yeah, from Territorial. Yeah, that's great. Right. Thank you. So, it seemed like Joe I had the pleasure of uh, uh, learning about this a few months ago, and uh, really spent some quality time with the team learning about. The opportunity to really bring this uh, to where we are today. I've spent the last uh, 25 years in the learning assessment space and business, and I've been fortunate to um, have been included in the conversations. And Joe and Terry and I also have had a pleasure of working in previous organizations, and look forward to being a support to this as uh, as this continues to surface and scale. Great, thank you, folks who've been who who uh, who uh, added their their words of support and, and thanks to all the panelists. In the time remaining, we wanna to get to your questions and notice in the Q&A, we're, we're kind of juggling too. There's some questions that have been asked that have been answered uh, uh, and typed in. Sometimes one, one answer and, and, and at other times a couple different answers. And, and so thanks to the questioners, most of whom have listed themselves as anonymous, which is perfectly fine. And, and certainly the answers, there have been a couple that that the the panelists asked to be able to answer live. So let me get let me I'll, I'll read you the question. I know they're also on there, so I'm gilding, gilding the lily a bit. But I'll I'll uh, read the question and then I'm going to turn it over to Mark Miller who wants to answer a couple of them. So just in order, uh, the question is: How many prospective students have taken the test to date? Because the variance for use as an admissions test was recently granted, were JD Next test takers told it might be used for this purpose? Couple different questions there, Mike. Mark. Right. So the second is easy, which is we did not tell students that it might be used for this purpose. We didn't have the basis to do that until we had a variance uh, uh, approved. And uh, on the first part, um, it's about 1,200 people have gone through the course and taken the test over several years. The uh, north of 2,000 started last year. We have north of it's about 3,500. This summer, obviously, they haven't finished the course or taken uh the test yet but the data we submitted was based on um not just the first limited year but each year we've had more schools uh, participating and and providing the data and we can show that growth for each year and you can read the the peer review studies to see the basis for the um assessment so i i want to also add if mark will permit me that you know without the permission from the schools you know, I don't think we're any of us are in a position to, to to list the schools, but I will say, having been part of this project and a fly on the wall, it's a a broad and diverse range of law schools. I can at least say that that have been involved in these in these pilots over the course of a, a number of a number of years. And on that note, I'll I'll just add, we've also broken out our validity data by different school cohorts. Uh, uh, you know, um, schools. Or have different, you know, admissions uh, strategies and different levels of selectivity and different levels of median LSAT scores. So we want to make sure that the exam is a, is a valid and reliable predictor at all those levels. So, for example, we had uh, schools in the top 50, school, uh, U.S. News rankings, middle 50, and top 100. And of course, I don't want to center the U.S. News rankings. I could give you the LSAT scores instead, but 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 you understand how they they stack up. Um, uh, and, and we found very consistent results for the JDNX program across all different um, schools. Um, and then uh, in, the, in a subsequent year, we did a split a different way. And again, found very significant results uh, across, across all uh, median LSAT scores. So um, yeah, I just want to mention that wide range. Great. So let me ask uh, this uh, question. And, and if you had, uh, 
well, I'll just read the question. Does the inform and Mark also, you wanted to answer this one. Does the information on the variance form, as well as the data collected on the JD Next admitted students, go directly to the ABA, or is someone else receiving it and then sending it to the ABA on our behalf? No, it goes directly to the ABA. We that form is an ABA form, the variance form that they've set up. Great. One of you asked whether uh, 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 said declared that it appears to follow the Khan Academy method of teaching. Is that right? Jess, you uh, indicated you wanted to answer that. Um, I'm I'm not uh, super familiar with Khan Academy, but I believe it probably is similar. Um, students have short videos. None of the videos are more than um, like 15 minutes long, and many um, run less than that. And um, it's geared more at adult learning and so we we break up the videos and then they they have um, a short video and then um, do a some type of assessment or activity um, around that video so that they're actively engaging with the content great thank you uh let me just catch up here uh blah, blah. are we obligated to add this to our application and website if we complete the variance form Maybe Bill or, or uh, Stephanie might have an answer to that. So Bill, you're still on mute. mute, sorry. I have to do at least once a day, sorry. <laughs> Stephanie can correct me. I don't think we required this for Arizona. Um, and so I don't anticipate it, but clearly when we um, approve the variance, we'll tell you if that changes. I don't, I don't think it will. <laughs> Let me add to this another question that maybe uh, you, you all in ABA could answer. Uh, when the scores are sent by January 15th, is it just the score which is sent, or is there information on percentiles or how this score compares to others who took the exam? A anyone who wants to. That's right. We've uh, we've actually been piloting um, some school reporting forms with a few schools uh, in the past, and so we've gotten uh, some uh, uh, some distance in figuring out how to make sure this is a meaningful uh, data point for the schools. And so um, uh, we will also be uh, uh, working with our uh, vendor uh, and, and strategic uh, partner from the testing world to, to finalize those decisions as well. But, but the bottom line is absolutely yes. We wanna give you a meaningful number that helps you predict the performance of the students at your school. Right. And uh, and so that's that's the sort of thing that there's really the whole point of this. So it's a make giving you a meaningful number will be key. This is sort of an add on uh, from a different uh, attendee, but just on that same theme, Chris, maybe you, will we be given guidelines when we get the students test score so we know they've been successful with the program? Yeah, so we'll both report. I mean, one measure of success is that score. So we'll tell you, um, uh, you know, how how well the student did on the exam. We'll also be able to tell you whether they completed the course or, or how much of the course. So like I said, you'll get sort of both pieces of information, the course as a credential and the test as a score. Got it. Uh, question says, can you say more about how the interpretive tool would work? Talking about here about the test. Uh, intuitively, one wants to have a sense of how a given JD Next score relates to a given LSAT score. So, sort of answered that question before, but maybe just a little bit more on that, yeah. Yeah, so um, we're talking with our psychometricians right now. As you can imagine, there's some sensitivities to making a crosswalk from one test to another. Um, and, um, uh, and we're still sort of debating exactly what's most useful for schools. And um, at the very, uh, what, one thing we'll be able to do is either predict um, student GPAs at your school, be able to tell you that the students like this uh, tend to do, you know, in, in, in this range of the class. Um, um, or can give you a crosswalk to a familiar score like the LSAT. We definitely appreciate that feedback and know that, that you'll need a, a way to make the, make the outcome reasonable, but we also need to make sure that it's, uh, it's uh, the data we give you is quality as well. <laughs> so we don't wanna just give you a crosswalk that's not you know, um, based in the data itself. So we'll definitely do to have a, a useful solution. If I could just add a footnote, this is an obvious point, but it's never stopped me before, <laughs> which is a lot of the reliability and the efficacy of this will rely on or depend upon law school's willingness as law schools to give up this data, right, or to provide data, I, I suppose, it's fair to say. 
including data that's not necessarily required to be disseminated by the ABA, uh, assuming standards don't change, right? So that's that's a you know down the road issue, but but it seems to be an, a central issue to deciding really to fine tuning exactly uh, what it's telling you about a uh, a B or C law school. Yeah, we'll, we will continue um, helping the law schools evaluate the data that they, that they have and that, and that they, they produce. But, but one of the big changes this summer is that we didn't require schools to, 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 to commit to providing data merely to use the, the course as a bridge program. Um, so um, uh, we feel like uh, we have a huge wealth of data already, statistical significant results year over year over year. And so uh, my view is we've got lots of data, but we'll, be, we'll continue to be, to be in discussion with the ABA on what additional analyses they will want going forward and with the deans, what analyses they will want going forward. Got it. Uh, a questioner asks, as someone who's a more general law school administrator and not a specific admissions person, it would be helpful to hear figures for taking the LSAT and sending scores versus taking the JD Next course, taking that test and sending scores. I'm not sure I understand the thrust of the question. To see, I, I, I'm interpreting it as just simply saying, what's the volume of LSAT scores that are that are going through? This is from somebody who's not living in the trenches of the admissions business and probably knows it off the top of their head. Uh, but just the volume of LSAT scores that are being sent versus the volume of 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 folks taking the JD Next course now. This is obviously in advance of the variance and 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 to come. I mean, at, at this point, we know from LSAC's own data that they administer the L LSAT um, hundreds, over 100,000 times per year. And depending on whether you count tests administered or test takers, you can get different numbers up in the 130s or more, 130,000. And so, I mean, I think we'll, we'll see how many law schools uh, decide they want to go down this road this year. Um, but we're, we're prepared for, to administer thousands of these as needed, either this year or next year. We'll see how fast the growth is, um, but um, you know you got to start somewhere. And we've already had, as we've said, um, forty schools participate in validating all this work with us in the past. So we're going to start small, but we're going to start smart with this efficient scale to make sure that, that we can do it right. Right. I read that uh, this is from a questioner. I read that students will have to send a JD Next report to schools who accept them. Is there a cost to students to do this? There will be a cost um, to take the exam and to send scores um, to schools, just as there is for the LSAT. Um, exactly how we structure the reporting versus the testing, um, uh, it, we'll, we'll have to announce that around September 1st. That's the plan. But there will be costs, just like with the LSAT. Great. So this is interesting, a longer question, but let me unpack it. And if I need to go back and read it again, it's on the list here. I understand that participants in the research study were largely already admitted to law school. And given they were explicitly told that their future schools would not have access to their performance in the program, have you considered the impact on performance when used in the admissions context? That is, given the stakes will be considerably different and participation will occur at a very different stage of the application process, might participants' performance be different, parentheses worse? Absolutely. Um, uh, the, you know, it, there is a bit of a chicken or egg problem, right? You can't use the test in a high stakes environment until you use the test in a high stakes environment. Um, but that, that being said, um, A, uh, we did give students incentives, um, cash incentives to complete the course and take the exam. Um, and so um, it was not for nothing. Second, um, you might actually think that um, there will be a, a sharper correlation, a better correlation if you have students really paying attention and trying just like they will be in law school, paying attention and trying where, where law school grades, whether we like it or not, faculty can debate whether we have too much emphasis on grades, but grades have stakes. Um, so if we can have a test with stakes aligning with grades at stakes, as a scientist, I might see a higher correlation when we go from stakes to stakes rather than low stakes to, um, as in the research setting. So yes, I think this is exactly why we need to proceed cautiously and uh, with a data orientation but, but no, I think um, we got to start somewhere and, and we, we've set a reasonable footing for doing so, as I think the ABA's variance um, acknowledges. Great. Here's a couple questions I think can be answered quickly, and I know we're running down on time. Is there anything that grades applicants on their writing, or do you provide a writing sample? The answer's no, right on that. On that. Well, the, the, as we've developed the test, it's had um, 60 multiple choice questions chosen out of a much larger bank of questions. Um, that are key to um, uh, the uh, 15 learning objectives. 
um, and, um, and an essay. And we've looked at, uh, scientifically, we've looked at the combined score of multiple choice questions in an essay, as well as, um, uh, as, as just the multiple choice. What we've decided to do, there's pros and cons to both, um, but tentatively, we'll announce this September 1st, but tentatively, we're going to administer that essay as a writing sample that will be sent to the schools. And it is an essay, not, you know, it's an essay on, an, it's an issue spotter essay. It's a law school exam essay. So this is another piece of information you will get. It will be tentatively where it will be ungraded, but we'll provide these to the schools. Um, uh, and, uh, and then you can see how well the students are doing legal analysis yourself. So what you'll receive is a multiple choice score plus the ungraded essay. And again, our data shows that the multiple choice data uh, scores are predictive uh, at the levels I've shown you. Here's a question I was wondering the answer to myself, so I'm glad someone else asked it. For many law schools, not having a test score until mid-January would actually put them behind all the applications received and completed before then. Is there a plan to accelerate this timeline in future cycles once the score reporting mechanism is in place? Yeah, uh, Chris, I can take it. The short answer there is yes, we're trying to be modest and realistic about this first year. We want to add an additional and science-based pathway, but we we know that the test has to be run with high level of security. Reporting has to be uh, independent and confident. So the, the, the answer is absolutely yes on a plan going forward with partners to do more administrations and, and earlier in the cycle. But this is the Time frame and support we thought we could provide with a high degree of, of confidence and care and reliability because it, it it's a high stakes decision it has to be done well and right. But please um, email us. I've got our emails up here. If if um, the exact dates, one of the reasons we're not announcing them today is um, is we'd like more of your feedback. Uh, we noticed that virtually all schools say they accept that that mid January LSAT score. If, um, if, if it's important for you to receive the score in December instead, let us know. And uh, now, let us know in the next few weeks. Everything is, uh, is, uh, is, is being refined and, and additional input from our users is, is, is really valuable. Right. Here's something about the course, not uh, so much about the test. Is there any discussion about offering different topics beyond contracts, like torts or criminal law? Parentheses, we don't currently teach contracts until spring semester, so the onboarding is slightly less synergistic for our applicants. Yeah, and the short answer there is absolutely. It, it's, it's a huge amount of effort to develop the materials and, and, and build them. We have many of them, you know, because we do a Bachelor of Arts in Law, that's the materials we drew upon initially in contracts. But conceptually, what we've done, the theory of what we're assessing could be tied to other subjects, and it's absolutely something we'd like to develop over time. Great. Winding down, but let's get a couple of these extra uh, last minute questions in. Can a student repeat the JD Next course to increase their score the way you can retech the LSAT multiple times? We're prepared for that being uh, rolled out in the future. Um, uh, probably not, uh, it just wouldn't be feasible in, in, in this initial rollout coming this fall. We'll, we'll have one course administration. Uh, and the testing in December and January. Let me, while I have the mic, Dan, can I uh, be sure to, to make sure we've, we've uh, had introduced Dr. Jess Finley, um, who's been the director of the JD Next program. She's currently overseeing the, the summer administration with something like 3,000 students from uh, over 35 law schools. So uh, she gave me the podium today uh, to, to, to present on our behalf, but she's really been a and a co-author and investigator and leader of the whole program. I want to make sure that she had a chance to say hello. Thanks, Chris. I, I um, am happy to be here. And uh, many of you I've probably been in close contact with. Um, I had a, a car accident recently and, and I'm okay, but I have a mild concussion. So I haven't quite felt up to um, I'm presenting. Um, and I appreciate the rest of the team taking on the heavy lift today. Um, but I'm here and I'm happy to answer questions or meet with you individually if if that would be helpful. Great. Let me ask this last question, then we'll get ready to sign off, keep everybody on, on the schedule. Uh, uh, what information will need to be shared if we agree to accept applications from JD Next students? Any, anything to add from what's been said before? Uh, really, the only thing that, that we're requiring at this point is what's on the variance form. So that's really a question then for Bill. So, I mean, it's an experimental program. 
and we want to see that it is a valid and reliable predictor. So I think you're going to expect us to ask about student progress. That will, we'll ask about attrition, we'll ask about grades, how they compare with um, people you've admitted through traditional means. Um, and if data shows us that there are things we should be concerned about, we may ask follow-up questions to that. But generally speaking, I think you can under, uh, anticipate that it will all be about the kind of, of success students are having, and is it the kind of success that we feel comfortable there's a reasonable chance they will graduate and be able to be licensed? Great. Well, I, I don't want to have the last word. I want to give that to Mark or Chris, but I'll have the second to the last word. And, and, and in addition to thanking all the panelists, I want to give kudos just as, just as a civilian who's been in the trenches of legal education for a long time to the great work uh, that Bill and Stephanie and the ABA Council have given. This is remarkable when you think about it in, in sort of record time, the ABA considered this uh, carefully uh, in, in, in within the maelstrom, uh, shall we say, what's going on in the admissions world and all of that, and has given their imprimatur on an experiment, which is what this is after all, and their willingness to not bend their rules, but to adapt to you know, the need for experiments and innovation in these times is something to be to be admired and congratulated. And I know it wouldn't have happened without leadership from the top in the ABA. And of course, kudos to the extraordinary work of the folks at Arizona who who not only concocted this this uh, this this plan, but more than that, have really worked and nurtured this uh, systematically and scientifically over uh, over uh, many many years. It's, it's just really re uh, absolutely remarkable uh, remarkable to see. So, any last words from Mark and Chris before we sign off? I just want to thank everyone who's joined today, uh, everyone who's helped to this point. These are great questions we want to engage. Please reach out to any of us, whether it's questions on the science or administration. Uh, again, we're thinking through and trying to implement a lot of these things and want to be responsive to the needs and concerns uh, of schools as we do a cautious rollout. But thank you to everyone who's on today, and please reach out. Great. And thanks also to Access Lex Institute and ETS for really making this possible financially and for uh, their scientific uh, and other contributions as well. Great. With that, <laughs> thank you. Enjoy the rest of the uh, the afternoon wherever you are and and uh, and have a great rest of the summer and encourage you to apply for a variance. JD next. Thank you.